topic, when we don't see God, when we don't see God moving in our life and doing things in our life, and a lot of times we ask that question when we're down and out, when things seem bleak, when things aren't going too good, we kind of say, but I just don't see God moving right now. You know, last week we talked about, I've never heard of as a pastor saying, uh, anyone who's got things going really well in their life say, well, I just don't see God doing anything. I'm being blessed, but that wasn't God. You know, we always want to turn around and give praise to God, right? So, looking at the book of Esther. And so, I want to go back. Mallory, did you find the, uh, the definition of sovereignty? It said death sovereignty. Okay. Didn't have that in there for two, two weeks ago. Anyway, do um, you remember what sovereignty is? God having complete control over his creation, meaning you and me, that we are part of his creation. He has control over that. And providence is talking about the way God moves people through in and out of our lives and makes things happen to bring glory and honor to him. And so that's what we got to think about when we think about we don't see God. How is the sovereignty of God playing out in our lives? Um, today, we're going to be looking at some things that, um, as Esther, just like kind of us, I want you to see in advance that Esther's going to look at her life, and she's not going to give glory to God for God working in her life. You know, sometimes people that we know, and maybe even you, when we are blessed by God with something, we kind of think, well, I made the right decisions. I took small steps here and there, and I finally got to where I'm at. I have been rewarded for my hard work. However, as God and His sovereignty and providence working her to get her right where He wanted her to be at a particular time. So, uh, we do the same thing, just like Esther, you know. There's people out there that uh, God blesses, and uh, they, they think they've done a fantastic job. And they won't say that it's a miracle from God unless it just kind of drops in their lap out of the sky. And bam, did you see that? Man, God blessed me. Woo. However, it's all the small steps that God's got for you to get there. So, let's take our swords. You got your sword with you today? You ready to go into battle? We're ready to go into battle, right? Alright, I'm not even going to start it. Someone else start it. Amen. Amen. I love to hear it. I love hearing that. Alright, Esther chapter 4, verse 14. Esther chapter 4, verse 14. If you didn't bring a Bible, if you don't have a download on your phone, uh, iPad or whatever you have there, go ahead. Uh, here we go. Esther chapter 4, verse 14. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, and you and your father's house will perish, and who knows whether you have not attained royalty for such a time as this. Let's pray. Oh God, I come to your eyes. Thanks so much for the power of prayer. Father, today uh, we pause just for a moment to pray for the people of El Paso and Dayton. Father, uh, we know that as long as sin is in this world, bad things are going to happen. Father, to good people, to bad people. And Father, we, we sit back and, and just uh, praise you for the days coming when sin will be completely paid for. The wrath of God will be taken out on this world and will be in your presence. Father, we pray for those individuals and those who have lost loved ones and wondering why. Father, I ask you to speak to their hearts. Father, right now, speak to our hearts. Where we are, it's not by accident, it's in your sovereignty and your providence that we are here. Someone has invited us, we know someone. Uh, we checked out the church on the website. But Father, you have got people here today for a reason. To have a divine appointment with you. So, Father, speak to us. Speak to me. Speak through me. We ask for the things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, this past November, Trish and I, um, we decided to uh, relocate from out of the countryside and move in town where the property was flat. So, Knowing that looking in advance that our sons will be 
moving who like to take care of the yard and I needed some flat land because once they're gone then um, I want to take care of it. And, um, when I was younger and didn't have knee problems like I do, I could take care of it. So we, we looked around for houses and finally Trisha found this house that she really liked and she goes, this is the house I want. Tony, that's the one I want. And I said, okay, uh, did you see the kitchen? She goes, oh yeah, I saw the kitchen. And so we started talking about it and saying, okay, how can we remodel that kitchen? Because I'm going to tell you something. In fact, I almost put pictures up, but I was like, I can't put pictures up because, wow. Okay. But let me just draw you a little picture here. The kitchen was blue. Everything was blue. And for some reason, in the kitchen, it had painted. Not just uh, border, that's the word I was looking for, border. It wasn't just border, it was painted blue pineapples. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, and so I looked at this kitchen and I go, hey, God would have to work a miracle to make this kitchen okay. Uh, so Tracy Watson, one of our members here, who works at uh, the home center uh, in Circleville, and we brought Tracy over to the house, and, and he does his little magical things, and he took measurements, and we had my uncle there, and we said, we're about to tear out these things, Charlie, remember that? We've got to tear the soffit up there, and we said, okay, we don't know what's in there, but probably got something, but we're not sure, and sure enough, pipes running through there, and, and uh, I was like, uh, he brought a couple patterns in, and Trisha goes, that's the one I want. I said, well, if you're happy, I'm happy, everything's good. So we picked out this kitchen, and we said, we're going to start the remodel process of this kitchen while we're living there uh, on this certain day. And it seemed like a good idea at first, uh, because honestly, we thought, hey, it will be all right. Well, I didn't tell you was that we decided that we would work on it because I worked a full-time job. Uh, we were having, my uncle Charlie was coming in and doing some demo and, and work. But Tracy worked a full-time job and he was going to help us out. Um, so we decided we'd work on this kitchen in our spare time. <laughs> the boys were playing basketball you know, two or three nights a week, and uh, then church, you know, and study time for sermons, and do you know about halfway through that process of not having a stove, not having a microwave, not having a sink, it started to wear on me. <laughs> and I was like, oh, oh, oh. Oh, and literally, we couldn't get that kitchen done fast enough because it was driving me. You, you've got no idea how much you use a kitchen sink until you don't have one. Okay, you have no idea what it's like not to have that microwave for instant food. You know. It's not there, and it would just dust everywhere. I mean, it was terrible. Finally, it come about, and I was like, yeah, look at this Trisha. And we started getting our appliances from Carol, and it was like, we brought them in piece by piece, and you know, it, it was amazing. Carol was, we bought the whole package. Why don't we just have them all delivered at once? I said, I gotta get the refrigerator now. We didn't have a refrigerator. It was downstairs. I, you know, so I, I said, just got to have something. So we did, piece by piece. I tell you that story for a reason. The reason is, we as Christians do the exact same thing. And here's what I mean. We as Christians say, hey, you know what? I really want that new life. You know, I want to live for the Lord. I want things to be good. And so sometimes God and his sovereignty and his providence will tear your life down.
to get you where you are, to build you back up. And during that process that you're going through, that remodeling process, you get frustrated. You go, well, I just can't see God moving in my life right now. Why isn't he opening up the door saying, this is the step, this is the step. That's not the way he works. So we want that we want that remodeling thing and going on in our life, and then we want to do things like this. And I'll talk about this even more. We say, God, you can remodel my life. I'm ready for you to tear it down, build me back up, because it'll be all for your glory. But don't touch this area right here. I like this part of the kitchen, the pineapple part. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> So here's what we do. Put something in your Bible right there in Esther. We're going to come back to that. But I want you to turn to Romans. Romans chapter 12. And look what it says here. Romans chapter 12 verse 1. of God to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God which is your spiritual service of worship. When we want God to do those miraculous things in our life and say, hey, don't touch this area right here. And I kind of like this area right here. This is mine. But God, all the rest of it you can have, but this one right here. Clark, I think you've mentioned this before, but uh, there's a saying, I don't know if Clark came up with it or somebody else, but uh, the problem, you know, where it says to be a living sacrifice, the problem with a living sacrifice is that it keeps getting back up off the altar. You know, we say we want to sacrifice our lives and, and strive to be holy, but the thing is, when we go to make that sacrifice, we go, oh God, not right there, hey, that's my life. And so we try to climb up off the altar. I said this last week, and we'll say it again this week. God has a purpose for your life. I don't care who you are, but you're sitting here, maybe you're hearing my voice or something like this. This is me. I don't care how old you are, I don't care how young you are. God has a purpose for your life. Amen. God has that purpose for your life. We are to present our lives as a living sacrifice, trying to fulfill that purpose that he has for our life. Now go back to Esther, chapter 4. Let's look at verse 11. Look at verse 11, what it says here. <clears throat> All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that for any man or woman who comes to the king, to the inner court, who is not summoned, he has the one law that he be put to death unless the king holds out to him the golden scepter so that he may live. And I have not been summoned to come to the king for these 30 days. Now Esther's talking here, just give you a little bit of background. Esther's talking, and Mordecai's telling her, hey, here's what you need to do. You need to go before the king, try to save all the Jews because the member of Haman had this law that that one day they're going to be able to kill all the Jews, all the Jews off. And so uh, uh, Mordecai's asking her, go before the king. Go before the king, ask him to save the Jews. You know, that's what happens when, when God starts working in our life. We start doing the very same thing that Esther did, just did right there. You know what she did? Come up with an excuse. Oh, hey, hold on a second. You know what? Uh, I'd like to, but uh, if... Do you, do you know the rule? The rule is that if I go before the king and, and he hasn't summoned me to come there, he may kill me. Now, that's a pretty good excuse. If I go to the king, I may die. I mean, that's probably at the top of all the excuses that you can give. I'm probably going to die unless he puts a scepter out to me. He hasn't asked me to come to him in 30 days. You know what we do? God, I know, I know you got a plan and a purpose of my life, but uh, I don't speak well. 
uh, maybe until God's working in the children's program. I don't like children. <laughs> you know, that's probably not the area he's really calling you to. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> God, you want me to do what? Uh, are you sick? Mm. And so we start coming up with excuses. Go on, go on to verse. Uh, go on to verse 13. What says there in verse 13? Literally, I just lost everything, but I got it back. <clears throat> then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not imagine that you in the king's palace can escape any more than all the Jews. You know what I like doing? <clears throat> when someone gives me an excuse, I like to take away their excuses. So what Mordecai says is, Hey, you think just because you're in the palace, that you're going to escape, you may die if you do go before him. Chances are you're going to die if you don't. You know, uh, I was, I used to be a youth pastor, my former. I've had teenagers say, hey, I'm going to go get school shoes. And I, I do things like this, you know, uh, shame on me for even saying it. I just do it, I tell you, because you might want to use it. But anyway, uh, I'd say, Boy, what kind of shoes do you think the Lord was wearing when we carried that cross to Calvary for you? They go, oh. That's not really a good one. Uh, I'd say a lot of things like that, you know, thinking that I could take away their excuses, but really they had to take away their own excuses and they had to come up with it. Mordecai was just trying to get her to understand, hey, need to think about this. Let's think about the big picture. You may die if you go before me, and you may not. But chances are, that day when they go to kill all the Jews, we will kill you. Look at verse 14 again. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise from the Jews from another place. Why did Mordecai say that? This, this is not my notes. I was going to tell you. The reason Mordecai said this, that the, there would be uh, relief from somewhere else, because God was going to send the Messiah through his people. And there was no way that they were going to be wiped off the map. And so God was going to send someone. Now, notice something in this verse right here. For if you remain silent this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. And you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not obtained royalty for such a time as this. Did you, did you see that? Did, did you read it? Did, <clears throat> does your translation say, maybe God has brought you to this point for such a time as this? <clears throat> does it say that, hey, God has, has worked his way and he's going to send relief, maybe not for you or something? Remember, God's name is not, not mentioned in this book at all. But the king's name was mentioned 190 times. But I want to tell you this. God was in complete control and had her exactly right where he wandered through time and, and through all those things where she could have said, well, God has really blessed me. I've become the queen. Look at this. He's got me right here. She could have said that, but no. She's thinking, hey, I, I, I can't go in there. I've got all that stuff. I can't take a gamble on losing that. I can't do it. We say the same thing. I can't go before someone and tell someone about Jesus because you know what? They might look down on me. Hey, I might. Uh, I, I, you want me to help that person or you want me to go do this? I can't do that stuff. That's beneath me. Someone else will do it. You know, I, I, uh, I see that, that thing, that the last sentence right there in verse 14, for such a time as this. Have you seen that on t-shirts before? I've seen it on coffee cups. You know, coffee, for such a time as this. T-shirts, for such a time as this. What they leave out during that, that saying right there is that really Mordecai is browbeating her. He's scolding her, saying, You, you need to go do this. Who knows? The very reason that you're in this spot right now 
might be for such a time as this that you could save the Jews. Who knows? God has been living her life for years. Remember a few moments ago I said God had a plan for your life. He has a purpose for your life. Now, I know some of your lives right now, where you are at spiritually. I know where you are emotionally, some of you. Financially. And here's the thing. When I tell you God has a purpose for your life, I mean you. God has a purpose for your life. And where you're at right now, listen to me, the sovereignty of God. God is working to get you right where he wants you. So you might be on the very high of life. You know, you might be on the mountaintop experience. Woo, yeah. God's got you there. Hey, you might be down in the very low valley. Guess what? God's got you there for a reason. You might be, like I said a few, week, uh, a few weeks ago, you're going into a trial, coming out of a trial, right smack dab in the middle of the trial in your life, and God has got you there for a reason. He's allowed you there. Romans 8, 28, for all things work to the good of those who love the Lord and call the Lord His purpose. If you call yourself a Christian today, God is going to use you and where you're at in your life to bring glory and honor to Him and to fulfill the purpose that He has in your life. Amen. Do you really believe that? So you say, God, right now I'm going through a tough time. Physically, I, I, I'm struggling. Guess what? He's got you there for a reason. You say you don't see God moving? Hey, he's moving in your life. He's got you right there. He wouldn't have you there if he didn't want you there. Remember what he said to Job? He, said, he was talking to Satan. Hey, Satan, have you considered my servant Job? And he allowed him to go through that. Hey, you, you're going through a tough time in life. And you're saying, well, I just don't see God. How's God? Pause just for a moment. Would you please? Would you just pause for a second and say, God, because what can happen, listen to me, we can, we can focus more on the problem than we can on our God. And we can make that problem see so much bigger. Clark, you and I have talked about this. Our, we make our problem see so much bigger and our God so much smaller. But it's the opposite. God is so much bigger and our problem is so small. There's no problem you're going through in life, no trial, nothing that you're going through right now that God can't handle. And I'm telling you what, you're right there, you're on that mountaintop, hey, God's got you there for a reason. He's got you in that low valley for a reason. He's going to bring you through it. Just pause for a minute and say, okay, God, I'm going to take my eyes off of that problem that I'm going through right now, and I'm going to focus on you. What do you want me to do? God, I'm trusting in you. God, I, I, I'm trusting in you right now. What do you want me to do? And that's when you need to start digging to get closer to God. Put that next sentence up there, Val. God will never force you to fulfill the purpose that He has for your life. God's God. He will never force you to fulfill His purpose for your life. He'll never do it. However, He will enable you. To fulfill that purpose. Amen. I told you last week I'm, uh, I'm kind of a shy individual. And I really am. Mm -hmm. um, but I make myself talk to people. Uh, you might be the same way. Moses <laughs> used that excuse. I'm not a very good talker. I'm not a very eloquent speaker. You know what? Uh, I'm not even. In the last few weeks, uh, I had people come up in the church and go, Pastor, he was really on fire. I said, no, the Lord was. I, I, honestly, sometimes it surprises me. They can use an old redneck hillbilly uh, to, to spread his word. But the one thing is, I love him more than I love my wife. I, I, lo I love him and serving him more than I like being back with him. <clears throat> Do you realize?
this right now, that God has given you the job that you have? Do you realize that God has given you the position that you have? Do you realize that God's given you the resource and the education that you've got? God has given you the relationships that you've got. He's given you so many more blessings, and what we can focus on right now is just that problem we got. Really, what it comes down to is this. That's what it comes down to. Yeah. It's faith. You know, I, I shared with someone this morning. They asked me how I was feeling. I said, not very good. I, I've been struggling. Um, and, and it's tough. Um, and and I, I, Rhonda tells me every time she sees me, I'm going to pray for you, Pastor. But I, I need it. Okay? Physically, I don't know. I may not got all kinds of energy. The next minute, I'm struggling for every breath I got. I feel like my chest is not ready to be out. Uh, my chest, my heart. <clears throat> but here's the deal. How can I told this person this morning? I'm going to keep doing what God wants me to do. And if I'm on this side of the dirt, I'm doing pretty good. If I'm on the other side of the dirt, I'm doing fantastic. Amen. I don't want to leave my family. I don't want to leave my life. I don't want to leave my children. I'll tell you that God calls me home because the Bible tells me that I have a point in time to die. And here's the deal. If I'm on the other side, I'm standing in his presence. Amen. And I know my family will be there one day. You see, that's faith. That person also said that it was hard headedness for not going to the office. <laughs> It is faith. We have to back up what we believe. You see, the opposite, put that out there, dollar. The opposite of faith, you know what that is? We're walking by sight. Take, take your Bibles, turn, turn to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Let's talk about what the definition of faith is. chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, convictions of things not seen. The assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So faith is walking Without seeing the final outcome. We might, God might open up that door so we can see that next step. Maybe two steps. He might not show you any steps. And go, hey, I want you to go in this direction right here right now. And you're going, what? I, I, I want you to go before the key. What? God had been working in her life for years. Her parents died. She gets adopted by her cousin. I worked at it. And then, and then he got her in a foreign land, and she becomes beautiful, and, and she becomes the queen for such a time as this. See, all those times that God was working might seem like small steps, might even seem like a sacrifice, might seem like a problem. Yeah, you lost your parents, but God's going to bring glory out of them. Hey, guess what? You're going to move it to a foreign land? Guess what? God's going to bring the glory out of them. Hey, you have been taken in by the, the king's uh, uh, soldiers that are going to make you be his queen. Guess what? God's going to get the glory out of them. Amen. Small little steps. Turn to 2 Corinthians. Go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Or, I'm sorry, chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Look what it says here. Verses 5, 6, and 7. Now he who prepared us for this very purpose is God. Who gave us the Spirit as a pledge. Do you ever feel like 
just for some reason, as a person you go, I think I want to stop at this store right here. And you run into someone and you say, to them, Hi, April, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. Things going good? Well, you know what? Would you pray? For me? Yeah, I'll pray. For I'm glad we ran into each other today. I wasn't going to stop her, just felt like I needed to come here today. And I ran into April. That was just a hypothetical. Okay, but that, that's the way God works, and you're, the Spirit kind of guides you through there. And you go, oh, I look back and that was God. Go well, to verse 6. Therefore, being always of good courage, <laughs> don't we struggle with that? Sometimes we're the cowardly lion. We, 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 we sound good, we talk good, and then when it comes, oh, I'm scared. Okay. Always a good courage, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Verse 7 years, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Faith is acting on what you don't see. Faith is believing God's word. Faith is taking one step. Might not know where you're going. You say, God, I've been praying about this, and I feel that's where you want me to go, and I'm going to take the step of faith. I'm going to step out of faith. You know, faith is taking that step, even when you're not sure where it's going to go. Faith is that, that is taking that step and saying, you know what, well, God, I don't see the, the end right away. But I'm taking a step. Faith is when you're in that, that downtrodden position and, and you just feel beat down by the world and say, you know what, God? I'm struggling. You know it. I know I'm not alone. I'm not going through this alone. And I'm going to continue to do what you have called me to do until you tell me to do something different. You know, throughout the Bible, people had to take risk, big risk at times. They needed that courage to make that big risk step of faith. And guess what? God did miraculous things to those individuals. What makes you think God can't do something miraculous through your life? When we say that we cannot see God in our lives moving, here's the question. Are you walking by faith? Or are you walking by sight? See in the book of Esther, God's name is not mentioned. But God was working. I'm telling you right here, right now, God's got a purpose for your life. You might be in a bad situation. You might be in a good situation. You might be sitting there trying to figure out what God wants out of your life. I'm telling you, He's moving even when you don't see Him. Amen. For some of you here today, I'm telling you, you're not here by accident. God has a purpose for your life. That purpose might even be to be a part of this church. Or you can serve the Lord right here. In a few moments, we're going to give you a hint of invitation. We're going to invite you to step out and be maybe a part of this church. Maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ for your life. I'm telling you, he's got something for you. Okay, he's got a purpose for your life. In a moment, you can come forward and say, hey, Pastor, I want, to be, I want to be a Christian. I want to be saved. However you want to say it, we'll have both those decisions. We'll have someone walk into another room, let you fill out some paperwork, ask you some questions, have prayer with you, and then rejoice. Maybe you want to come to the altar and pray. Say, you know what? God, I know you got a plan. But right now, I'm kind of searching for it. I don't know where. Woo! God, this trip that you've got me on, I'm going through all kinds of things. Let me tell you, the reason you might be going through it just might be for this thing, right? This, it might be for one supernatural thing. 
you might be going through this situation right now, the false God is going to use you to help someone else with that exact same situation. Why do you choose me? He's God. Taking me, but I'm going to step out. 